Hi everyone, welcome to Duality Repair. This time I have a Rotel RB1080 power amplifier to look at. I'm not going to go through all the specs, but I will flash the spec sheet right now, so if you want to take a look, go ahead and pause the video. Alright, so this thing is in really good shape cosmetically. It's a dual channel amplifier. The right channel is working perfectly, but the left channel has an issue. So let me go ahead and power it on. Keep in mind I have no input connected. So you can hear that popping as I turn the amplifier on, and you can hear the loud humming as soon as the protection LED uh, was extinguished. And then you can hear it pop really loud as well when I powered it off. Now I'm not going to do that again. Not sure if we have DC or something on the output. I'm not going to do that um, anymore just to protect the speaker. But what I'm going to do is going to hook both outputs, left channel and right channel, up to two 50 watt 8 ohm dummy resistors. And then we'll hook those up to my oscilloscope. We'll take a look at the differences in the signals. And that'll be a good starting point for troubleshooting. Here we are at the oscilloscope. I have my faulty left channel on top and my working right channel on the bottom. Let's watch what happens when I power the unit on. You can see we have a steady wave on the left channel and uh, absolutely nothing on the bottom channel, the right channel, as we should. So I'm going to power it off because the resistor is getting really hot. I want to have that on uh, as little as possible just to protect the unit. Uh, so the next step is just going to be to open this thing up. We'll take the cover off. Take a look inside. There may be something very obvious on that left channel board. Uh, it may not be so obvious, so let's get it open. Here's a look inside the unit. Let's just go through some of the main components. We have our power coming in in the back left here. It's going to come in through our power supply section up here in the front. We have our main toroidal transformer. We have four filter capacitors, two on the right for the right channel and the two on the left for the left channel. And then we have our respective amplification channels. The left is for the left channel and the right is for the right channel. Pretty simple. Now I have inspected our left channel amplification board uh, as best I could. It's on its side, obviously. Uh, I can't see any of the transistors. They're all mounted on the bottom and obviously uh, attached to this heatsink. So what I'm going to have to do is pull this entire module out so we can inspect it more closely, try and identify what is causing our issue. My suspicion is that it's one of these main filter capacitors here or uh, one or several of the power transistors. I'm okay with any of those being, um, being dead, being the problem because I can replace those at a uh, fairly low cost. The only thing I don't want it to be is one or both of these main filter capacitors here because those, um, they, may, they may be available through Rotel, uh, but if they are, they're going to be fairly expensive and they may not be available at all. So really hope it's just something, one or several things on this amplification section here. So one thing to do for safety before I start disconnecting things on this board is to check for residual voltage on the capacitors. So they're only rated at 80 volts because our rail voltage is slightly lower than that but they are I think 10,000 microfarads so they could definitely give me a nasty jolt if I'm not careful. So let's go ahead and check for residual DC voltage and I'll just check so there you can see it says 26 but that's millivolts so that's nothing. Let's go ahead and check this one And that's, again, 25, 24 millivolts, no problem. I'm not going to touch these, but I might as well check them. 25 millivolts and 24 millivolts, no problem. So any DC voltage has been um, drained out of those, so no issues there. So I'll just come back once I have this unit removed, and we'll take a closer look at it. Let's take a closer look at the left amplification channel now that I've removed it from the unit. If we scan down the board here, you can see there are only five electrolytic capacitors. Those are one of the two components that I would suspect in this type of issue. And really I would suspect one of these two. These are our main filter capacitors. You can see around the big ones, let's look at this one closely, you can see that glue there there's glue on that one, and there's glue on that uh, that one right there as well. Now I have two problems with this glue. One, 
some of the glue that they use at these factories can break down and you can see this is breaking down it kind of chips off look at that piece it's a loose piece of glue right there it can break down over time it can break free and it some of it can also become conductive electrically conductive which is obviously a problem for the capacitor itself and then any nearby components you can see what may be glue um, touching that diode there looks like it's starting to eat away at that diode so that's problem one with glue problem two is that it can mask potential electrolytic fluid leaks so I've seen it where it looks like it's just glue on the board but you take the board off or you look at the back of the board and you can see that it's definitely been leaking electrolyte so it makes it really difficult to tell if any of these capacitors have been leaking this one in particular looks like it's got some discoloration so it, you know maybe it's been leaking it's really impossible to tell until we flip the board over and even then we'll have to measure all of them with the ESR meter so we'll do that I will remove this board from the heatsink but first I want to test all of these uh, power transformers or power transistors excuse me uh, for shorts and that's something easy to do before I remove it from the heatsink so let's do that first I'll just start on the left and I'll move my way all the way to the right first one's good So all the power transistors are just fine, or at least no shorts. So now I'll go ahead and remove the board from the heat sinks, and we'll take a closer look at the bottom. We can inspect uh, some of the other components on here. I've removed the board from the heat sink. I did check all of the electrolytics with the ESR meter. There were no problems whatsoever. They were all well within spec. And I also checked all of the non-power transistors for shorts. I didn't find any shorts, but I did find an issue with one of them. So let me zoom in on one part of the board here. So if we take a look at these components here. So we look at this capacitor C625. And obviously it's got that glue around it, that glue that I was talking about earlier that can cause problems. If we go to the right from there, we'll see diode D603. You can see it's got a lot of that glue build up there on that uh, lead right there. And then to the right of that, I have transistor Q611, and then trans, or, uh, resistors R615 and R617. Now you can see a little bit of a discoloration in the middle of both of those resistors. I did check both of those. They are uh, what they need to be in value, so those don't seem to be a problem, at least right not right now. This is the transistor that I found a problem with. So from base to emitter, I have a voltage drop of 0 0.03 volts in both directions. Now, in one direction we should have about 600 millivolts, or 0.6, and in the other direction it should be open. In this case I have 0 0.03 um, volts in, in both directions, so that's definitely a problem. And so now I also want to show you what I found, which is a major issue with the diode. It's going to be hard to see. Let's see if I can zoom in anymore. That's about it. So I'll do my best to show you what I found while holding the board. All right. So I'm going to apply pressure to the diode body itself and watch. So you can see that. You can see it's separated from this bottom lead here. So this diode is completely broken off and I'm pretty sure it's due to that glue just eating away at that and so if we look at the schematic we'll see that that diode is directly in line with that uh, transistor that's also measuring faulty from base to emitter so we have diode 603 here directly connected to the base of Q611 and so what I'm thinking is that that diode went basically open and it caused issues with Q611 and this is in the pre-amplification uh, pre section of our board here. And so if there's issues with this transistor and this diode, this could definitely be causing our noise and popping issues that we see when we turn the unit on and then when the unit's on as well. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to replace that diode and I'll replace that transistor 
I'll take another look around the board and make sure I don't find anything else, and if not, we'll get this all back installed and test it. I was able to remove all six power transistors, and I tested each of them with the multimeter and the diode function. Each junction tested out just fine. I also connected each to my DC power supply, and I simulated the rail voltage of 73 volts between the collector and the emitter, and none of the transistors showed any signs of leakage, no current flowing through them whatsoever. So I'm going to go ahead and rule out the power transistors as being the fault, and my new theory is that these transistors are being turned on all the time which is why we're seeing DC voltage on the output. So to test that, I have a few jumpers hooked up to some of the, the bases of some of the transistors. I'm going to start with a transistor from our working right uh, channel. And so I have the first jumper hooked up to the base of transistor Q646. So let's go ahead and power it on and see how that looks. So here we go, all powered on. and you can see it's reading about 550 millivolts so that's just under the turn on voltage needed to uh, turn on the transistor so now I'll go ahead and check the base of the transistor from our faulty channel so this is transistor Q637 let me go ahead and check the base on this and look at that 3.3 volts so yes the transistors are being turned on all the time I'm going to go ahead and turn this off to prevent overheating or uh, damage, further damage to any components. So all of these transistors are being turned on. They're based at about 3.3 volts, so they're definitely turned on. So now we need to go backwards. So we'll want to check the uh, previous transistor, the transistor that's driving these. And in this case, this is transistor Q635. So when I come back, we'll check the base of Q635 and we'll compare it to the base of our working right channel. All right, we're ready to test the next transistors in line. I'm go ahead and start with the good right channel. And so I think before I said Q620, but I'm actually looking at Q636. So I have my lead hooked up to the base of Q636. Let's power it on and take a look. Okay, so we have 1.125 volts. Let's go ahead and switch to the transistor from our faulty channel. That'll be the base of Q635. And look at that, we have 3.5 volts on that one. I'm going to go ahead and turn that off again. So we'll just have to keep working backwards until we can find the issue. So our power transistors are being driven and are being turned on constantly by Q635. Q635 is also being turned on 3.5 volts uh, constantly. So we have to keep moving backwards. Uh, I suspect we'll be looking at uh, Q619 next. After replacing Q613 and Q615, our symptoms didn't change at all. So I thought I'd just go way back to the input section of the circuit and check the bases of Q601 and Q607. And surprisingly, those are reading 2.4 volts each. So I checked their adjacent transistors 603 and 609, and those were also reading 2.4 volts. So something was not right. I checked the, uh, all the components around there. I checked these resistors on top, 607 and 609, as well as these on the bottom, 615 and 617. Those checked out just fine. I checked these capacitors here, 627, 605. Those are fine. And R665 was fine as well. So I thought maybe something's going wrong with these transistors themselves. So I replaced 601, 603, 607, and 609, and that actually alleviated the issue. So we no longer have that... Uh, voltage spike on turn on and we no longer have the residual or the uh, voltage on the output. So let's go ahead and take a look. I have my meter in uh, volt mode 
And I'll put it max so we can see the max voltage at turn on. The unit's powered off right now. So here we go, I'll turn it on. Absolutely nothing. So it didn't even reach 1.1 millivolts to turn on. So let me go back to just standard volts mode. We take a look. So we're reading negative 24 millivolts. Nothing. Fantastic. So, of course, we still have one issue. And this is actually due to me cutting corners. So let's go to the oscilloscope. That'll uh, give you a better idea of what's going on. I'll tell you what happened there. Here's a look at the output from our left channel. This is a 2 kilohertz sine wave. You can see the peak in the trough of the wave look just fine, but we have some very noticeable distortion in the center. And this is caused by the corner that I cut. So let's take a look at the one set of the transistors that I pulled. So you can see that they're formed together with a piece of heat shrink, and then in the heat shrink they also pumped a bunch of thermal compound. And the point of this was to keep the transistors at the same operating temperature. Now in a circuit like this, if you don't have these transistors at the same temperature or very near the same temperature, they're going to conduct differently. And this is going to cause distortion, which is what we see. So I cut the corner of not um, mounting it just like this as I should, but I really just put two transistors. Um, I, I just installed them one next to another. They weren't uh, connected in any way, so they're definitely going to have different temperatures. So let's watch what happens when I uh, put a little bit of hot air on those transistors. So I have a heat gun, I just set it to pretty low temp. And uh, I'm going to just point it right at those transistors. So you can see the size and shape of the wave changing pretty quickly. And eventually it becomes a perfect sine wave again. So that's just me basically externally applying heat and uh, forcing these transistors to be the same temperature. So I'll take the heat gun off again, and eventually they'll cool down, and you'll see that uh, that wave transform back to what it should be, or what it what it will be, not should be. So um, I'm disappointed in myself that I did that, but I'm gonna fix it. You know, obviously I'm not gonna I'm not gonna leave it the way it is. So so here's my new set. I pretty much did it exactly how they did it. I had a whole bunch of these spare transistors, so it wasn't really a problem. I have a heat shrink. I uh, put a bunch of thermal compound, sorry if it's not focusing very well, put a whole bunch of thermal compound just like they did in the top and the bottom so that they should be really well uh, connected thermally. And I did it with both sets. You can see both sets here. So I'm going to install these and uh, run it for a few minutes and I hope that I don't get the distortion. See, we're already seeing the distortion come back here. After replacing the transistors again with my modified versions, uh, I've been running for about five minutes, and as you can see, the sine wave now looks uh, very clean and crisp. So the last thing to do is to check the actual audio output. All right, I put everything back together. I have my speakers hooked up. Let's go ahead and see what it sounds like. All right, sounds pretty good. So this one is fixed. I appreciate you watching, and we'll see you on the next one.